an organization of residents of Princeton Borough and Township with diverse backgrounds, interests, and talents. Princeton Future has grown out of a concern that much of the planning and proposed development of the critical downtown spaces have been proceeding in an unconnected manner. The aim of Princeton Future is to assist the municipal authority to take a forward-looking and more comprehensive approach. Investigation and consultation undertaken by Princeton Future indicates that these objectives are achievable with good planning. More detailed studies and further involvement of all concerned parties are, however, clearly called for. So those kinds of considerations, and certainly, as Mike said, where they're located from, from township to borough. We're going to go on, on to the utilities, which is the next page. There's power communications, which is all the overhead power and cable lines. It's destroying the trees in their own sight, and people are really find them to be the, the scourge of the street. That had just one basic reaction, put them underground. <coughs> Yeah, that's right. We got our U-shaped trees. Um, you know, where else to put them? But underground, if they're going to be constructed. How, how we get to that, that's, well, that's later. We'll try to figure out. We can get that one pole moved by PSE and DF corner of the library, so we'll see. Uh, underground pipes, manholes, um, and how that system gets burdened by further development sizes increase. Um, they're also impacted by the large root systems that from the larger trees that are already there. And then storm drains have a very uh, curbside placement. Um, I happened to meet one with my right rear tire turning a corner on Franklin. And it's odd that I thought I was moving around the curb. And many of the corners now have a slope ramp section. But Oh, I hit the curb a lot. Well, I didn't hit the curb. It's a manhole with it, it's, you know, it's a big steel thing. <laughs> and it tore right into my tire. And I didn't realize it was dark. It was night. And someone was on my back side trying to so I gotta turn it here quick because they're gonna barrel me over. Lo and behold, there's a manhole right where you'd expect to be able to walk and have to have the ramp. So they are in an odd place. And that hopefully will be uh, corrected in the reconstruction. Land uses and zoning. Let's go on to that. Let's just broke the methods into two different sections. Building uses and physical conditions. Concerns for property that neglect um, areas or buildings that are at risk for redevelopment. Um, commercialization or referred to as Downtown Creek, institutional growth. Um, with regard to property neglect, the rental, co uh, rental properties were exempt. The, um, there was, there's evidence of overcrowding and the impacts of that presents. Underdeveloped, I'll put this in quotes because that relates to what the site is physically and its permission to do something else. Not, that's not a value judgment. And that is purely a relationship of zoning permission to occur in uh, existing structure. But that means it is in threat to be something else. Um, and this is the social issues of loitering, and which is in part uh, a, um, a subset of um, relationship to a crowd. Now, on property neglect, I think there was more discussion with around that. And that there's an issue around absentee landlords and how you deal with that. Well, no one has necessarily solved that problem, but one of the things is, is that there is the overriding theme that to maintain residential uses or rezone residential to prevent further commercialization. Um, with commercialization, use ordinances to strengthen you know, the residential character. And that has more to do with building size, uh, scale, occupancy. Not just that it looks like a house, 
but it is a house and people live in the house. Uh, and the concern around institutional growth is that uses become intensified. I mean, that maybe a house is a structure, but it's being occupied. If it's an institution or, or a commercial place, then it's really occupied by many more people and obviously they bring more cars and other, other uh, demands on even the systems within the building. Um, yeah, um, on, on this, the, we, we would look at these three together, the zoning, the land use, and the building fabric. Um, and let's just take uh, the issue of commercialization and over here where we're saying maintain residential uses. Uh, uh, use ordinance to strengthen residential character and use. Uh, so the zoning is an ordinance, there are housing ordinances. Uh, on, on the land use, the way we are uh, approaching this issue is that this zone in particular and this zone in particular, the goal in terms of land use is to preserve the residential character. Uh, and, and you can see all the yellow. Um, and a lot of the yellow is only yellow. Uh, the, the mixed uses are shown where there are, in fact, two colors. And it's possible in this particular area, and we discussed this, so maybe we can continue to tell what the advisory board thought about that, uh, that in, in terms of this zoning ordinance, it wasn't the issue. Well, so the zoning ordinance relates the percentage of the kinds of uses. In this particular, all the way across right here, where we're preserving the residential character in terms of zoning, we actually felt at the advisory board that the B1, which allows exclusive business use, should be rewritten to a percentage so that it was, in fact, misused. If, if this all became red, which is possible right here, uh, under the B1, then we no longer not only have residential character, uh, we don't have mixed use at all. Um, in terms of the, the building fabric, it's also very significant, and it goes with this, that the zoning ordinance also uh, allows, it, it uses formulas of bulk and density and setback and coverage. What is very significant to this residential character as a use is in fact tied into the building fabric which I call a small building grain, like a grain of wood, a closed grain wood, an open grain wood, so to speak. And it's this grain of, of, of a very dotted line, as opposed to the massive bulk of downtown, or even the large buildings down at this end. So maintaining that grain is as significant an issue as the youth. They have to be done together so that we, this zoning must be written so that it prevents changing that grain of independent structures into the consolidation, not only expansion of the footprint to the limits allowed by the zoning code. Consolidation, which allows you to build a long, big building, which is a lot different than that grain that we see here, and actual enlargement. So that's what we need to prevent here is the changeover, in, which is which is partly on this map, partly showing the change of grain here, that this kind of building, by assembling properties, uh, should be prevented. The other thing we felt that that is so important, that character that is expressed on these three zoning, the zoning, the, the use, and the, and the fabric map, is that there really should be a line drawn here and this fabric stays here. And essentially that means the kind of dense, intense, large-scale, consolidated business uses have no place on this street. So this is meant to say that that's the Maginot line right there. That stops the tanks um, on their way to the low rent of this site. A lot lower rent either here and here, or here and here. So if the cost of the raw materials is the same and the cost of the labor is the same, the way you make more money is to change the, the rent factor. So this is low rent compared to 
So that these three maps, there's an economic system behind all that, um, is that the character, the land use, the character expressed now by, uh, enforced now by the zoning, um, and adding in this factor, essentially must go together and be preserved. The instrument would be one, probably, that first is the zoning. Um, Shirley Satterfield is not, not here, she's going to come a little later this morning, um, on character and, and, um, and history, but she certainly knows much more of the detail, but Wanda Gunning certainly is here. In, you'll find in the minutes a very long uh, description from one of Wanda's, um, I guess it was the workshop sessions, and, and Sheldon was able to capture that. Um, describing how the, the land area in much of the northern uh, section up to Wigan Street of uh, Witherspoon Street uh, became to be today. Um, in sort of just a basic summary, not going as far back as Wanda did in terms of ownership and transfers, the north area, previous community gardens, a dump, on the west side of Witherspoon Street and various other, other uses before it was developed into public open space and improved with the sports fields and parking. And most people have felt to preserve and enhance the functionality of that as a system for the whole community is important. That's basically says that. The township municipal building and the service um, and public works facilities, township built it, municipal building being new. Um, there has been discussion that the, there is a relocation uh, potential for the uh, for the public works facility, and so that would tend to help how the Route 206 intersection, as well as the uh, landscape opportunities, uh, might present themselves if those facilities are moved. Um, with regard to building uses, the area had an outline character before much of the development occurred all around, all around it, 
um, providing affordable family housing. It continues to serve historic Italian-American and African-American families, as well as many others, of course, and preserving the character, the use, and affordability of that residential, I think, has been a real concern to those who have lived there for a long time, and even those who've recently moved there. It also served as an, uh, an area for neighborhood small businesses and had um, the kind of character that it, it is attempting to sustain today. However, they were a neighborhood and they were small. What's happening is they're becoming more large institutional and regional businesses. Um, and the issue around that is that the restoration of increased residential uses one should in part curb that, but that neighborhood commercial opportunities should always be uh, possible. In fact, those homes that may have commercial could very well be live work environments or, or small uh, shops owned by um, the owner of the property or small shops that are, are rented. I think there have been many discussions around how to manage commercial properties within residential. And so the concern around the relationship of the owner to the property, uh, not being distant, not being um, absentee, has been a real uh, concern. And that that has as much of an influence on, on the character of the neighborhood uh, as does any other um, factor. Now, implementation being the last piece that goes up at the bottom and to the right. Um, there are two, two pieces that we're looking at right now, but there are some others. One is the master plan, and in one of our sessions, there was a, a section that refers to Witherspoon Street described. Um, it's intended to provide areas for small-scale retail and office needs first part of the sentence, of the community, while preserving a residential character and existing residential use. While the structures remain <coughs> residential in, in character, the problem is, is that they're not necessarily staying residential in use. And that's being permitted, of course, in the northern section, as Michael pointed out, through through the zoning. You can change the residential building to 100% commercial. But another aspect, I guess, of that sentence, while well, that's, that's taken out of the master plan, is that there's sort of three, three point parts to that. First part is that the Witherspoon Street is described more as a purpose to serve the commercial. Because that's the lead part of the sentence. The essential residential character as, by example, a um, packet use of a residential property, which they did not change physically in the exterior, but changed the use. And the existing residential use has no time specific in terms of what's existing. And so the, the terminology is very confusing. Preservation can only pinpoint one point in time, but the one point in time has not been specified. Preservation is only as we see it today. We need to be more clear about how we want it to be because preservation is not saying enough. Existing is as it is today, whether that is the model for how it should be. So it lacks the time determinant or the measurement. Okay? We need to establish more of a fixed kind of use in the sense of either a you know, per lot, which is a percentage zoning phase, as well as the area's character, which could also be balanced within a percentage. So for example, the central section of the school where there's Jefferson and the, and the auto parts, where they are totally commercial in use today, how do they impact with that RV zone, but it's supposed to be a 60-40 60 uh, residential, 40, and it's primarily residential. Starting point here, but there'll be sheets for each 
we have obviously, through the advisory committee, begun to talk about the whole street. And we are going to continue to do it we're looking at more in detail of uh, the parcels that are on the street, the intersections, the landscaping, all of the issues. Um, and those meetings will likely will be every every two weeks. I'm suggesting, and I don't know if uh, Michael, you have you know, more to say, that we sit in the Um Well, we could ask for respond well, to things good. that have come up today that um, critique, add, augment, supplement, <coughs> tell us more, um, <coughs> what, whatever. Um, <coughs> clearly, we have not actually charted maps 12 and 13. As you can see, they're not up here yet. Map 14, of course, isn't here either. And uh, the implementation map uh, also would begin to include a list of items or projects um, <coughs> as well as uh, instruments. So the master plan is an instrument, the zoning is an instrument, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is just a very uh, initial, uh, the first overlay that, uh, that gets added to and, 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 and so we're planting the seeds for all of this now. Uh, we will hope to evolve these to become more specific and, as I said, more accurate, more focused uh, as we continue the process. Yes. Take the uh, library, please. Oh, yes. uh, I'm interested in what your timeline is <clears throat> because, um, although I know that a moratorium is illegal, um, <laughs> I'm glad I said it because <laughs> I think we do need to look at perhaps some <coughs> specific recommendations that, that you all could make to give us some breathing room here. Um, and I think one that I've heard is uh, to try to pass zoning ordinances in the borough and the township that would disallow combining lots. And that would be one important one to just, I mean, in the end, it may be decided that in certain places it makes sense to, to um, combine lots. Um, and I wrote down here, oh, the setbacks. Um, that we might look at, uh, that may get more complicated um, because the setbacks vary so going up and down the street. So maybe that's not one that we can look at. What I'm looking for are but suggestions. that variation is important as we see here. So right. somehow or another we have to come to grips with that. I agree. Yeah. You're absolutely right on target. That that has to be actually not left entirely to chance. Right. Uh, so what I'm concerned about. Moves to the street. Yeah. Then, then we have no charge. flexibility as we go along. So that was, I was concerned about that and whether, I, I mean, I'll, I'll talk to um, the township and the borough and see how complicated that would be to, to maybe just, see, I, I, I can't even think of how to say. We either take an average setback and just put it in place or, but all of those things get so complicated that we, we'd never get it passed. So what I'm looking for from, from maybe you or the steering committee are relatively uncomplicated <coughs> ordinances, a couple ordinances that you think might give us some breathing space here to contemplate the changes along the Hillsborough Street. Because obviously we have, we have to get, you, you've got all of these suggestions, then they need to be presented to Borough and Township. There needs to be a conversation there to the planning board. Um, and that's going to take months and months and months. And public comments. So that's that takes a long time. So if you have any thoughts for me, I, I mean, I certainly can pursue the um, not combining lots. If I recall at my table in December, the recommendation people had for immediate 
impact would be to become more strict in the zoning variation process and really start to uh, and realize the irony of me as an architect suggesting this, <laughs> to really clamp down on what, but really in every individual case, I can stand up and make a presentation why we should have a couple more spaces and we should get a variance for a few feet on this setback and a few feet on that setback and I can make a good argument why the handicapped space should be in the front yard. And, but the truth is every time we let one of these conditions evaporate in the existing fabric of that neighborhood, every time we give a variation from the existing zoning that's already in place, you know, we're a step farther down the road. So if you're looking for an immediate action, yeah, actually, right that's, away, a good, that's a good point. A moratorium on variations would be very simple. <laughs> just a, or a, a one, if you're percentage, just a, a one percent. I mean, if you're actually limited by a percentage on certain factors, whatever it areas, you have to set some kind of limit. Otherwise, the variation has no guidance. Is anything you suggest and negotiate? The perception among a number of residents was this, the the. Uh, uh, it t became tantamount to a kind of spot zoning where each individual property owner would show up with their proposal to develop their property in their way, not asking for major use variance, but asking for, you know, five little things that in the sum total of six properties down the block really start to have an impact over time. So, uh, in looking for something to do now, we probably should look very carefully at really what we have and find a way to become you know, I hate to say it, but harder on us architects who show up asking for all of these uh, excuses from your regulations. I have something directly related to that. Well, we're the hired guns. And I, actually, I do too. I was going to say the exact same thing. You know, that the moratorium, since you found that it's illegal, uh, if you stop giving variances for a while, you know, the, uh, the St. Clair building house won't turn into the town topics. In, in, in you know, the next few months, because I'm sure they need some variances. Mm -hmm. Even though they could do a commercial right? Yeah, and and if, you, if, if that's done now, maybe um, you can in in the in the interim time, as, as what he was saying, then put some changes in place. I would like to remind everybody uh, of the flip side of experiencing variation process if the zoning is very divorced from reality as in R4 in John Witherspoon neighborhood then if you say no variations or very limited ones you can't even have what you have because you're not made to tear it down so I think that doesn't answer Wendy's question on time issue of how to deal with things but I think there is an urgency in my mind for the community to readdress the zoning in a way that examines what is, what's good, and modifies the zoning. Because if you have 80 to 90 percent of properties that are non-compliant with the zoning in the area, then it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about RB, but I know R4 in and R9, and R9 are just totally out of keeping with what is. So. Well, for example, uh, it was too early to get reactions, but the reaction was kind of rolling eyes. We really don't know, but I think the cat reaction was it, it, it's something is not right. Maybe that's as close as we got. Okay, we uh, we're having a walk. Oh, Okay. Um, one thing, actually, several parts of it. Michael and Yanni, you've suggested the conception of imaginary line, and, and that seems to me is a really important issue that has to be discussed and reinforced. But the discussion today has been to the north of that imaginary line, not much to the south. But it seems to me that from, from what I hear, that everyone seems to really agree and accept that although it's it's dramatic to have a drawing and beautiful to have the drawing that shows the whole thing as one street. In fact, you've identified two very, very different streets below uh, and, and above. And it seems to me that must be come out of this uh, 
uh, discussion uh, very much, and I, sp I suppose at some future time you'll lead us through a discussion of what happens to the sound. Yeah. The one thing we have discussed and uh, has emerged, I believe, at some of the tables, was that um, the, the property here, um, right over there, uh, is a development opportunity, and we encourage that. Um, so from here up, though, it, it, it seems like so much of it is really capable of being worked out under the existing set of instruments. Um, it might be that the zoning, of course, housing, housing ordinance would apply it all the way down here. My second question we don't want to apply uh, to it is uh, um, spurred by Kevin's um, willingness to, uh, <laughs> to speak with respect to what architects do. But I wonder whether your advisory um, committee, which is, oh, by the way, I think you should point out that this is a new aspect of Wave Benjamin's future, that you've expanded this idea to having a, a wonderful group of people that are uh, discussing how to work all over the map. Right. Uh, do you have representatives there from the real estate and development committee? Oh, well, I have an development advisory committee. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff, sure Jeff, Jeff the was there. Commercial. Uh, real I mean, it seems to me. Broker. You, you, you said that there's a development opportunity right across the street. It seems that it would be very good to know where the real estate community sees the future for development, it's just to get the, the risk, um, to see the, where the interventions might occur. Uh, find out what, when greed, greed takes over, what happens, <laughs> and, and what might happen, because most of us here are talking about or rather organic incremental change. But I think you should hear the bad news. But we're lucky we have Jeff. He has, I guess, both sides of it. He is a resident Good. on North Witherspoon. He's also a real uh, commercial real estate broker, so he sees the green every day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, <yeah. laughs> He'll be passing out cards. <laughs> Um, I think I'll be quick in my comment, um, but as we approach this discussion, I was concerned that we haven't done enough to identify specific opportunities and constraints. And I think that um, you can look at opportunities from a development point of view, or you can look at them from a um, urban planning or community point of view, and they might be entirely different perspectives. But uh, I'd be interested in knowing, in addition, property at Witherspoon and Hallfish, what the other development opportunities are along Witherspoon Street that you might envision that you can foresee as a possibility. Well, the, beyond, beyond the hospital, of course, the obvious. Yeah. I mean, but we, beyond that. We didn't mention that today, but in terms of zoning, we, we were thinking about a reparcelization in terms of building fabric, that the building fabric on its edges would certainly reflect what's happening and that it should be mixed use should be multi-type, multi-cost, residential, diverse, and affordable. So those are the three things we come up with. Now beyond that is, I think, your question, right? But are there other opportunities? Yeah. Well, there's Valley Road, Valley Road School, which we have not talked about. Valley Road School. We've well, so indicated that it, it, it is an interesting building now. Very valuable to the school board, I can tell you. But Corner House is occupied, uh, occupies part of it. Part of it is really unoccupiable at the moment because it needs so much renovation. So there is a future to that building. Uh, but, but and development can be in the nature of civic community space, and we can speak in terms of development for future public use and not just the private development that makes a lot of few bucks. I, I agree with that one, Kevin, in the sense that we, 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 the words I've always used as the, as the uh, I'm afraid to use bodily analogies anymore because we had the spine, the heart, the artery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in any way, the back uh, uh, the backbone the backbone of everything about uh, you know, trying to make something better here is, is really concerning the public realm, as well as preserving the public realm through instruments that manage the private realm. So the zoning <coughs> regulates the private realm, but <coughs> Somehow or another, this, the traffic is a mess, and that's the public realm. 
Um, so all of that, it, it, that a developmental opportunity, I always think that that can include public improvement. I agree with that. Another challenge is I've heard uh, a number in the order of $65 million is what the hospital thinks its site is worth. If that, in fact, becomes somehow quantified as being accurate, that puts enormous financial pressure on that piece of property to generate some sort of income that props up someone borrowing or having $65 million plunked down there. So that could become the Trojan horse in the neighborhood if that has to somehow sustain someone's investment on that level. And that's a big development issue, I think. Right. I'd like to say, yeah, say something about that. That is not a value. I understand. No, no, it's an forgive me. Forgive me. The expectation, an expectation that I've heard the hospital because it's worth probably zero also right heard now to other, anybody else. I've heard on the flip side of the equation someone wants to offer, you know, in the mid teens for it. So yeah. Well, so. well, the thing is, it's all use the time. and unless another hospital comes and buys it right. and uses it as the hospital, Correct. then it it can't be purchased for any other use. So this is the process that creates the value, um, not you know, a negotiation with someone who's going to buy it and try to change the use. I think that's the point where we're having these meetings where people think I guess what I'm saying is it strikes me as that's the largest pot of money sitting on, on a table along Witherspoon Street somewhere up and down the street. It's on the table? The money? No, I mean as a development <laughs> pressure. Uh -huh. No, it's a pressure. That's it's the largest steak and chip sitting on Witherspoon Street. Mm -hmm. Stack. Okay. Uh, Hi, I'm Jeff Fury, the commercial real estate broker. <laughs> and there is tremendous opportunity out here on the street, on Witherspoon, in the present zoning. That this is a great opportunity, well, really, to change that opportunity to a degree. If I may go up to the board. Let's go here with the RB zone. What you see here is reality in the present way it could be done. Somebody could easily assemble this lot, number of lots here, put in retail office on the uh, first floor, and then do residential. The values are so high on the, on the residential right now. This is just not here in Princeton, but it's a phenomenon in New Jersey that is occurring. When you're selling uh, condo units, 300,000 plus in this neighborhood now, we'll go up to 400, it may go up depending upon the size, one, two, three bedrooms. They're gonna go up tremendously in value because this area will get cleaned up per se by the uh, houses that are being underutilized, you want to say, this is what's going to happen. People are going to sell out because they've never seen, right, they've never seen their uh, this amount of money in their life before, and they're going to cash in. Some of the residences could cash in. You know, a prime example is the Sinklers, $460,000 for that house. And you could do a similar thing right along here too, to very easily. I mean, there was there's an opportunity by Dr. Faselli. He has two lots right next to it. I couldn't believe he didn't buy the third one. He could have knocked all that down, put up maybe a dozen to 20 condos very easily, sell them, make tremendous amount of value. I, I'm telling you, a lot of money doesn't pay. Hey, this isn't, he realizes. He could have done. <laughs> no ideas. Opportunity here, like they say, you know, got to face reality. The hospital, they need to move. They need. They estimate two hundred eighty million dollars. Two hundred eighty million dollars. Build a brand new. They got to get as much money out of this as possible. Highest and best. Where can they get this? Through another medical type of use, be it a hospital be an adult type thing, mixed use with apartments, assistant living, and mixed use to a nursing home. This may, you know, they need money. 280 million, it's not just gonna drop from the sky. They need money. And, you know, this is tremendous, or they're gonna go out of business. They, they can't stay where they are here and exist. 
They're going to go out of business. I see opportunity all along here. And uh, it's very easy to make money. You assemble a few of these, make a proposal. I'm telling you, there's tremendous. All, and this is uh, in the present zoning, in the way it is presently zoned. Across the street, I know there's a lot of ideas. They've been churning over a period of time of what to do with the lot. Talking about uh, Times Square? No, right over here. Oh, right sure. I think we have to keep break. going here because we're All right. almost quarter off. Yeah, we're going to run out of time. Uh, that's good. I got to go too. <laughs> uh, the walk. Yeah, we plan to have a walk that's up and down with this one. We have a good day. No, it's very cold. We had rain uh, on Thursday. Um, we're hoping, you know, anyone who would like to, to take the walk down and back up, uh, it probably will take at least an hour, uh, depending on how long you want to talk. And, and stock as orders. Um, but we invite you all to do it. So, but we're glad you're here today. Came today, the next meeting, February 16th, 7, here at the library. And uh, watch the newspaper for the airing of the past meetings as well. If you missed any of them, they'll be on TV Thursday. Thank you all.